Uh, so what I wanted to do today was talk about some of the considerations for using pesticides on hemp. Uh, I was gonna delve a little bit into the specifics of what we have registered within Kentucky. So it's gonna be very state specific. And I'm also gonna talk about some things in the pipeline in the process for getting new pesticides available for hemp producers. So there is some confusion uh, with respect to what can be used and what cannot be used on hemp. Uh, some of this is due to state lead agencies uh, interpreting what is allowed on hemp differently. So really when it comes to the ultimate uh, authority where you're growing hemp, you need to talk with, uh, with your Department of Agriculture or whoever is your state lead agency for establishing uh, what is permissible. Um, so the result is growers in different states may have different pesticides available for use. Uh, obviously, uh, cannabis is different from hemp, and so that, that would be a, a, another area uh, of difference. Uh, and then there's the uh, uncertainty with how the FDA is going to regulate CBDs, whether it's uh, regulated as a, a food additive or drug, and, and that uh, also increases uncertainty. Uh, there is some uncertainty with the ag chemical industry as well. Uh, several large chemical companies are uh, waiting. Uh, so they're, they're sort of sitting to see, uh, uh, sitting out and waiting to see what happens. Uh, and th this affects, you know, when, when things uh, uh, begin to get into the pipeline uh, for testing and ultimate approval. Uh, for example, one large company uh, is only willing to pursue labels on uh, hemp for fiber and non-food uses. Uh, the bottom line is, uh, in order to register a chemical, uh, we have to have full registrant support. So the, the company has the final say if, if they're willing to uh, uh, see something move into this process. So in order to use pesticides uh, on hemp, uh, there's several things that, that uh, uh, must be complied with. First is uh, EPA regulations. Uh, now, uh, there are a few products that are exempt from, from these regulations. These are the minimum risk FIFRA materials. These are often re referred to as the 25B uh, materials. Uh, and uh, th there's a list of, uh, of those uh, active ingredients that are out there. And you can check that. Uh, uh, 40 CFR 152.52 F1. Uh, these, the second thing is that your, uh, whether or not a state registration is in place for a particular product. And that's where you need to check with your Department of Agriculture within your state to see even if something is registered by the EPA, it may not be registered with your state. And so uh, th those are two different things. And then the last consideration, it's not a legal consideration, but it's a practical consideration when it comes to marketing your hemp is whether or not uh, your, your buyer is willing to accept those pesticides used on the hemp. So EPA regulations, state, state regulations, as well as uh, what the buyer is willing to accept. Uh, you know, keep in mind that the label is the law when it comes to pesticides. Applicators cannot use pesticides inconsistent with the label. And the first sentence under the directions for use with every pesticide label is, it's a violation of federal law to use this product in a manner inconsistent with its labeling. Now, I, I did a, a search uh, last month on CDMS to see how many products uh, would show up uh, that had hemp on the label, and uh, I found seven pesticides. What was interesting is not all those are registered for Kentucky. So uh, even though they have federal registration, uh, only a fraction of those had state registrations. Now there are some minimal risk pesticides that do allow use on unspecified crops. And you'll see some verbiage on some of those labels like and other crops, uh, crops listed but not limited to, or crops such as. And so th those, uh, uh, there's a little bit more flexibility with some of those labels. We're fortunate that the Kentucky Department of Agriculture uh, has really been out in front of this and they actually list uh, what is approved within the state. Uh, they, they, they list what the considerations are to, to uh, have something approved within the state. 
And this is up on their website. You can see the insecticides, fungicides, miticides, and then the insecticide, miticide, fungicide products that are available. Uh, there are a number of them. Uh, again, this is very con Kentucky specific. Other states are gonna vary quite a bit. Uh, uh, you note that the green arrows there represent products that uh, were, were approved through the uh, 24C, the state local needs uh, registration process. So if you look at the products available in Kentucky, I break them down into different categories. Uh, we do have some products for corn earworm and tobacco budworm. That's a nuclear polyhedrosis virus of corn earworm. Uh, we have two products, Gemstar and Helogen, that are available. These are very specific products and will only affect the, these particular pests. We have some BTs. Uh, we have Monterey BT and Agree, Selective, and these provide caterpillar control. Uh, we have a product that's based on an AI with pyrethrins. Uh, we have a category of, uh, or I have a category of essential oils, and there's really a variety of different essential oils uh, in those various products, and they can affect uh, various insects uh, differently. And then we have uh, an oil, uh, the organocide. So with the Kentucky Department of Agriculture, the criteria for uh, pesticide use on hemp, uh, the, the label needs to allow use on unspecified crops if it doesn't have uh, hemp specifically on the label. Uh, it allows application to the intended site. Uh, it does not prohibit use on crops for human consumption, and it must be applied by a licensed applicator in Kentucky. Uh, there are several different types of registrations available. Uh, really, what I consider the gold standard is what we call the Section 3 label. You know, when you buy a pesticide at a dealership, uh, this is a label that you find attached to the, uh, the container. It's the most common type of label. Uh, you know, uh, a year ago in July, uh, the first temp hemp labels were approved. Uh, there is also a, uh, an emergency exemption. These are referred to as Section 18s. These are emergency or crisis exemptions. Uh, these are limited to just a single year. They're limited to a specific state, uh, but the EPA has indicated that hemp is not going to be available for uh, Section 18 approvals. Uh, what we have had success with is the Section 24C or the State Local Needs Registrations. Uh, this is where a product has a food tolerance uh, in existence. Uh, the, these are uh, uh, issued to individual states, and these are limited in time, typically to five years. And I have an example of, of uh, one, one of those on the right there. So, uh, Really, what we want to see are, are Section 3 labels. They're, they're uh, long. They, they, they cover uh, generally the, the entire country. Uh, pesticide registrants, that's the companies that produce the chemicals, uh, can pursue this with the EPA. The other way is through the IR4 project. This is a, a, a project that facilitates registration of pesticides onto specialty food crops, minor use crops. Uh, it's in cooperation with the registrants, and the IR4 conducts the residue trials and submits registration packages to the EPA. Now, that, that, that sounds great. Uh, it is a slow process. Uh, just like get, getting the vaccines for COVID is slow, getting pesticides registered on new crops is slow. And it generally takes three to four years to get uh, crops onto these labels. Uh, each year, the IR4 program uh, they, they run approximately 40 or so uh, residue trials on different crops in the country. This is uh, uh, the result of their food use workshop where they identify uh, projects in the coming year. And you can see in 2019, they identified two hemp projects. Uh, it's a very competitive process when you think about all the commodities, all the pests, uh, diseases, and weeds of those crops. Uh, so hemp was very, very uh, uh, fortunate to get uh, two of those places in 2019. Uh, and you can see in 2020, uh, we had two, two more uh, places for the residue testing program. And so this was for a, a herbicide as well as a fungicide. Uh, there's another uh, uh, process with IR4, and, and that has to do with uh, 
uh, screening of chemicals. Uh, and so uh, in 2019, they identified uh, uh, Lepidoptera or caterpillars on hemp to be a, 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 a pest problem without solution. And uh, they initiated a screening program to identify the best potential products uh, that could move forward for a residue testing program. And in uh, 2020, at, at that workshop, they identified uh, two other uh, uh, areas for the residue uh, or for the screening program. That would be mite control on hemp, both in the field and in the greenhouse, as well as uh, damping off uh, for organic hemp. So uh, th there still is some uncertainty. Uh, IR4 is uh, still working out the methods and protocols for residue testing. Uh, they aren't completely defined yet, uh, particularly with all the uses for hemp. Uh, we are still waiting the FDA decision and the EPA and IR4 are working together to develop protocols for the hemp uh, residue testing program. Uh, there are some uh, areas that uh, uh, can be petitioned for to, to uh, uh, for use on hemp. And some of these are the uh, EPA minimal use pesticides, not the minimum use pesticides, but the minimal use pesticides. And a lot of these products have tolerance ex uh, exemptions that already exist. And th this is just uh, uh, some of the insecticides that are out there. The green ones, we have been successful with getting 24 C's or state local needs uh, registrations. Uh, and th this is a, a, a longer list. Uh, the EPA is willing to support this process, uh, still needs support from the registrant, the company that uh, produces uh, the product. Uh, people that are interested in this need to work with university specialists and they can petition their, uh, their uh, departments of agriculture. And uh, this is a long list. There, there are over 200 active ingredients on this list. So strategies to move forward, um, minimum risk pesticides, those 25B materials uh, are available. Minimal risk, uh, they can become available through the state local needs 24C. Uh, in terms of the conventional pesticides, uh, we're looking at progress from IR4, we're waiting on the FDA decision, and we're looking for registrant support. Uh, 